Thank you so much. Ali, thank you for coming to my kitchen. This is a treat and our colors go so well together. I Perfect got the memo, see? Who <laughs> knew? <laughs> so this is the first time we've done a podcast episode, not just with video, but in a kitchen while cooking. Well, so, I'm very excited to be the first. <laughs> usually, I, you know, my, my questions are terrible, but this time my questions will be terrible and hopefully I won't chop off my finger. <laughs> so your questions will, will be so amazing because the topics you deal with are Thank you. so deep and important. And I specialize in tacos. So okay. between your conversation and my tacos, we'll have a great meal. So what are we cooking? So I wanted to make uh, something special for you that I love, which is nopales, nopalitos, cactus paros, mm -hmm. but I hear you've tried them before. I've tried nopales, but I've never cooked them. Okay. And I've always wanted to learn how. So this Perfect. is great. Okay, so so this is a nopal. Okay. As you know, it's a cactus paro from a cactus plant. And it has all these little thorns that you have to remove mm -hmm. or they'll prick your fingers. They're very persnickety. <laughs> and um, <laughs> in Mexico, you can buy them already cleaned mm -hmm. and diced. Which I think the moment that the U.S. starts doing these, yep. people will just start cooking with them and mm -hmm. eating them, and they're incredibly nutritious. Um, so I already cleaned them okay. and cut them into little pieces, and you can see how pretty they are, right? They're, they're, uh, you were saying earlier that they're like uh, okra. They're kind of the, the same uh, yes. material, the same texture. Yes, they're, mm -hmm. they're, and they have a similar taste in that mm -hmm. they're citrusy, yeah. they're... Um, like between cucumber, lime, and asparagus, yep. I would say, in terms of taste. But they're so, so crunchy. You can eat them raw. Not many people eat them raw. Mm -hmm. You can make smoothies, and they're so healthy. Mm -hmm. But to cook them, just like okra, yep. they let out this um, like viscous, mm -hmm. gelatinous substance that turns a lot of people off. But you just have to get past that and know how to cook them. So I'm going to show you okay. a very simple method. Okay. A lot of people boil them in water, but then all that substance gets there yeah. and it's not pleasant to see and to drain. So what you do is you cook them. Mm -hmm. So here I have my pan and I have just a couple of, I eyeballed uh -huh. a couple of tablespoons of oil. Right. It's over medium heat. I'm gonna add, I had like four little cactus paddles. I'm gonna add them here and then I love the sizzle. <laughs> <laughs> so what got you into cooking? Because you didn't, you didn't, you didn't start cooking. No, I didn't, yeah. Ali. I was, I actually dealt with things similar yeah. to what you're doing. I was a political analyst. I, um, I did my undergrad in Mexico City in political anal mm -hmm. analysis. I mean, I wanted to go into philosophy and literature, but mm -hmm. UNAM, which is a public university, was on strike. So I did political science and then I wanted to be an academic mm -hmm. and I wanted to focus on strengthening the democratic institutions of Mexico. Why? Well, what made you choose that, that particular field? That, fi that field, well, because I adore my home country, love Mexico, really believe in its people. And, and was very aware that there were some institutions that needed strengthening, you know, mm -hmm. to, for the improvement of the country, such as the electoral institutions, the civic culture participation, the improvement of rule of law. So all of those things that you study in school. And, and I kind of kept thinking that if I could add a little grain of sand, you know, to help a country that gave my family so much because because your family's history or migration to Mexico is also interesting. Yes, yeah. I think it's fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> so tell me about it. <laughs> so, uh, so my on my father's side, mm -hmm. my grandparents came from Poland very early on, before the Mexican Revolution, when they were very very little. They were fleeing the... A little salt to the cactus? I know uh, this yes, <laughs> yeah, yes, we are a little salt to the cactus. And, and as you can see, uh -huh. that viscous substance that we were talking about is starting to come out. Mm -hmm. A little bit like when you cook mushrooms and the water the starts water. to come out. Yep. So the trick here is to have all that substance come out and then dry up. Okay. Okay. So and so we're, okay, so we're your seeing family. as so you can see how yep. like ooey gooey that is. Ooey I don't mind it. Ooey gooey being a very technical cooking term. The, very, <laughs> very. We're being very scholarly here. 
More so because you're wearing a beautiful coat. I feel very intimidated. I feel like I have to be much more scholarly today. Um, but no, so anyway, so my grandparents from Poland, immigrants, um, came from the middle of farmland. Um, and on my mother's side, it was a, diff a completely different era. Many years later, um, my grandparents came, my grandfather from Czechoslovakia and my grandmother from Austria, and they were fleeing the Holocaust. And both sets of grandparents came into Mexico as most of the immigration in the country, just like um, the Africans and the Caribbeans and most of the Asians and Italians, because Mexico is much more of a diverse, it really is, you yeah. know, not melting pot, but mosaic than people think. People usually think it's Spanish, you know, old world and Mexican, native Mexican, but no, there's Asian, Japanese, Chinese, Filipino, there's Jewish, there's Lebanese, there's Italian, there's a lot of African and Caribbean, but most of the immigration waves have come through Veracruz, mm -hmm. which is that mouth that opens That's into the Gulf of Mexico, mm -hmm. and which, happens to have the most incredible food because it's where everything mixed. Yeah. So my grandparents came through there and then made their way to Mexico City. But Mexico was an amazing country to them. It gave them an opportunity to start from nothing. Mm -hmm. And the way that they grew roots was mostly through food. So if you went to their homes when I was growing up, it was this delicious mashup of uh -huh you know, the Eastern European and European and some of the Jewish flavors that got woven in with the incredible treasure trove of Mexican ingredients. Yeah, wow. And so I learned that, you know, from growing up. Um, and then my parents were born in Mexico, of course, me and my sisters were born in Mexico. And then when I was a young adult, I met my husband, also Mexican, and we decided to move to the U.S just for a couple of years so that I could finish my... Mm -hmm. Well, I had, I had already graduated political science and I wanted to be an academic, so I wanted to, to do graduate work. Yep. And I wanted to focus on strengthening democratic institutions. I was stubborn on the improvement of demo democracy in Latin America. And, um, and I started to get interested in, relation, in the relations between Mexico and the U.S. and the migrant communities. Mm -hmm. And we moved to Texas and we were there for like three years. And that's where our oldest son was born. Uh -huh. And what was it like? Uh, I mean, did you, when you, those first three years, did you think you'd stay? Or did you? So, no, no, no. So, we always thought we were going to come back. Mm -hmm. And here you see how oh, now yeah. really you see all of yeah. the viscous element that is coming out. And I'm going to start chopping okay. some onion that we're going to throw in there. And I was going to teach you something. Oh, yes. Uh, about nice onion. Skill. Okay. Yeah. So first of all, you have to hold a knife. This is zero common sense. Mm -hmm. You have to hold the knife from the blade, yeah. like these. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people do right. like these or like these. So you have to hold it from the blade. And then I'm gonna do a piece and I'll let you do a piece. Is it so you have more control over the blade? Yes, yeah, okay. exactly. Yeah. You have more control over the blade. It's less heavy and it becomes like an extension of your hand. Okay. And it's, it feels very weird in the beginning. Uh -huh. But so look, so I'm cutting half and I'll let you do a little, okay? Um, so holding it that way, I'm gonna make little lines in horizontally like this. And then I'm leaving space here. I'm not mm -hmm. going all the way through. And then I'm making lines here. And notice how I use my fingers. Mm -hmm. I bend them a little. You don't want to do that because you're leaving yourself very vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So you go like this and then because you are holding the knife the way that you should, once you get here it's like an extension of your arm. You do this like curvy thing. You don't go like that. Right. So you go like that and then you just go like this. See? There we go. No so pressure. Hold, no pressure. So you hold. You doing an amazing job already. <laughs> my, you cook. <laughs> you mean, I, my, mom, my mom taught me how to move, how to make my way around the kitchen. That's perfect. 
Oh, wow. And then when you get there, mm -hmm. I have towels for you here. I have a pretty towel that goes with your <laughs> coat and it goes with my sweater. How about that? Yes. You seem so, you seem yeah. a little too surprised. I'm, I'm very surprised because when you said I wanted to take knife skills, I thought you had no clue. But you seem deceivingly experienced here. I can cut an I can cut an I onion. I can cut an onion. Yeah. And then, okay, maybe another trick. Did you do you know how to chop chop holding it this way? No. Oh, okay. I'll teach you okay. something that you do. Okay. okay. So once you want to chop it finer, yep. You hold the tip like that, and holding it as you have it, you just move like that. Okay and then you chop as fine as you want. Okay, so you're in Dallas and you think- So you, I'm you... in Dallas and we were there just for a couple of years, Ali. We really had no intention of, um, of moving somewhere else or staying abroad. We really wanted to, to go back to our families and, and work in Mexico. Something really funny happened. How fine do you want? If, uh, super fine. Super fine, okay, keep going. <laughs> um, and so what happened was that for like a year and a half, I couldn't go to Mexico because I was applying for my papers. Yep. And you know, while, while you're applying, you're not allowed to travel. And I was in Texas, which is, I was in Dallas, which is so close to Mexico. Right. And it feels like Mexico, the weather, the sky, so many people speaking Spanish. You go to the stores and you find Mexican ingredients, mm -hmm. but it's a little bit of like a twilight Mexican zone because you find the Mexican ingredients, but they're not really the same. Mm -hmm. You hear Spanish, but it's not really the same. So I was really missing Mexico like crazy. And I was very nostalgic and homesick. And, um, and my way to feel at home mm -hmm. in the States was by starting to cook. I was a horrible cook. Uh -huh. I cooked nothing. But my way to feel at home yep. in Dallas was to start cooking the food that had nurtured me right. growing up. So I started stalking people. Uh -huh. You know, when I went to a grocery stores, Latino international stores, and I heard anybody speak Spanish or they had a Mexican ingredient, I would ask them, what are you gonna make with really? that? Yeah. <laughs> and what are you gonna cook? And you know, Mexicans were so, the way we open up is through food. Uh -huh. We can't resist it. So somebody would say, oh yeah, I'm using that lard to make carnitas. And I would say, how do you make them? And they would say, come over see really? so it was quite magical because i started connecting with the mexican migrant community so this is like the, this is like your first version of a cooking show yes <laughs> I, now that i'm thinking i should go back and do that because that's how i learned yeah and it exactly and it was it was a fascinating adventure to me because I, I thought I knew so, you know, when you're young and I had studied and I, it took three years to do my thesis on Mexican federalism and the removal of governors from 1860 to 1994. Mm -hmm. So I thought I knew a lot about Mexico and Mexicans and here I am in Dallas mm -hmm. meeting Mexicans from places I've never heard of, yeah. from places I've never been to sharing foods that I didn't even know existed. You know, you have your idea of how beans should be, how rice should be. Then you meet somebody from Yucatan and they're like, no, we make our rice <laughs> like this, we make... Uh -huh. So it was like, I was so far from home and I was getting to know Mexico while being away, so romantic, so nostalgic. And I grew this hunger mm -hmm. to dive into Mexico through food. Um, and I thought about, instead of going to graduate school for political <laughs> science, I thought about going into food studies. There's a college called El Centro that had food studies. But then I remembered what my mother had said. You know, my parents are divorced and she always said, never go in the kitchen. You need to be self-sustaining. Mm -hmm. You need to be a working woman. Don't trust a man. You need to, you know? Right. And now, and, and my husband who, really loved that I was starting to cook and um, he saw that I was fascinated with food. He kept telling me, go in the kitchen, go in the kitchen. And I was like, oh no, <laughs> I am not going not, in the I'm kitchen. <laughs> and so long story short, uh -huh. we were moving back to Mexico. By then I'm learning so much, hearing so many stories about Mexican migrants, mm -hmm. just like me, but so many different stories. And, and I'm really connecting with that migrant story you right. know and starting to connect with my grandparents experiences and 
we're going back to Mexico. My oldest son was already born. He was about to turn one and we're packed to go to Mexico. And my husband got a, an offer to move to DC. Oh, really? Yes. And we said, no, we're, and you can see how all the yep, viscous substance yep. dried up. Yep. You want it to dry a little more and then mm -hmm. we're going to add the onion. And so these, these people that offered Danny an opportunity to come work in DC, we were like, no, we're going to Mexico. And they said, come just for the weekend, no commitment. Meet, you know, the people in our, in our firm. And if you don't like it, you don't have to stay. We came. It was cherry blossom week. Oh yeah, that's not even fair. The the people who invited Danny hosted us to stay with them, mm -hmm. and they lived in a lovely little townhouse in Le in Cleveland Park. And we arrived really late at night, and I woke up in the morning to an upside down blueberry pound cake that I had never tried. <laughs> then they took us to eat soft shell crabs. Then I opened the newspaper <laughs> section and looked at the Friday cultural activities, uh -huh. and I was okay. We can stay a couple more years, and we ended up staying. Wow. But then I did a master's, I'm gonna add the onion. Yep. I did a master's in Latin American studies and wanted to be an academic. Yep. And um, met Michael Shifter, who was mm -hmm. my professor there. And um, I applied for a job at the Inter-American Dialogue. And I worked there for like a year and a half, mm -hmm. working on issues that had to do with democracy. And, and so I was- it, it, it was, but it wasn't doing it for you. I was so bored, uh -huh. I was so frustrated because I felt like I couldn't make any difference, that I kept, you know, doing this research and doing, writing these papers that I didn't know if Juan Perez was going to read them yeah. and I was locked in an office and I really missed interacting with people and cooking and um, and just one day I got into a sort of early existential crisis of sorts mm -hmm. and um, this is what happened. A peer who was Peruvian, um, I had been tasked with writing a paper that described the differences between the transition to democracy in Peru and Mexico. And the peer asked me um, if I had tried Peruvian ceviche because it was the best ceviche in the world. Mm -hmm. He was Peruvian. And I said, no. Oh no no, <laughs> no. no! oh no no! Sorry, no, no. sorry, you're confused. <laughs> it's Mexican ceviche. That's the best. <laughs> of course, without having gone to Peru. And so he said, "No, Pati." Pati he said, and we got no. to ceviche first. Peruvians no. got to ceviche. So I said, "Oh, let me research on it." Uh -huh. And instead of researching on the democratic process, I started researching on ceviche until late at night. Like, who got to ceviche first? The Peruvians or the Mexicans? Why did the Peruvians spell it with a B as in boy and we spell it with a V as in Victor? Why do the Peru Peruvians marinate the fish so lightly and we kill the fish, you know? And, and anyway, I came to my boss and I said, I'm of no use to you. I'm just thinking about food all the time. I resigned. I'm just thinking about ceviche. <laughs> yes. Enrolled in cooking school, started teaching Mexican yeah. cooking, and here you have me. Wow, wow. Making nopales for Ali. Thank you. So, um, and I, I saw that, you know, when you were talking, when you started thinking about doing a show, yes. that you had made a decision to focus on Mexico. Yes. Why? Because after being so many years in the, in the U.S., I met one after another preconception and myth about Mexicans. You know, what we look like, what we eat, what's our culture. And I was also very, you know, homesick and romantic about Mexico. And I really felt that people here just needed to know more about Mexico. That, you know, there was this idea of people already knew tacos and people already knew guacamole, but mm -hmm. there was so much more and I, just wanted to show people how Mexican ingredients and dishes can enrich any table. Mm -hmm. You know, how we can build bridges and how cultures help enrich each other. And how Mexican food can enrich anybody's weeknight meal and menus. And, you know, to show that Mexican food is not always spicy, not always greasy, um, you know, all of, all of the myths mm -hmm. that there exist. And, and it was also because I was fascinated with my own home country, you know? Mm -hmm. so, so that's how it started. And season one started, you know, we started with a tiny budget and 
it was very hard to get into, you know, the PBS system because all of the public TV stations have to approve of a pilot and a concept. And but now we're going on our so what, eighth what, season. At what point yeah. in that first season, maybe the second season, did you realize that okay, this is it. This is the this is what I want to be doing. Or did I you even mean, have to wait that long? I I have to tell you, um, from the moment I, I went to cooking school and, and I realized how much I loved it and my friends started asking me to teach them Mexican food and I realized that cooking and cooking schools don't have Latin or Mexican in their repertoire. It's, it's mostly European yeah, and yeah. French focused, which I mean a lot of Mexican food is based on French techniques because we have that in, you know, intermarriage, but um, I, I felt like that's what I needed to do, that that's what I was meant to do, and I loved it, and, and how it got into media, and I'm just gonna chop a chili. Yep. You like spicy? Yes. Um, so I, it was like, I hesitated, Ali, to switch careers for two years, mm -hmm. and it was super hard for me to switch because I kept thinking, I devoted all these years in all these years of studying and writing and getting this job and I'm helping my family and I have a salary and now I have three kids and I can't switch and you think you have to go right. in. But once I resigned, all bets were off because I was taking the biggest leap of faith. Yeah. And once I jumped into it, I didn't do much research on all the obstacles that I would face and I've been asked you know, if you knew all the obstacles that you had to go through, would you do it again? And I always say, I wish I could say yes, mm -hmm. but no. <laughs> so if there's something that you're passionate about and you want to do, don't research on it. No, no, you're no, going to no. freeze. Don't ask questions. Don't ask questions. <laughs> Just jump. Uh -huh. And so the moment I started doing it, I started teaching at the Mexican Cultural Institute. Mm -hmm. I had never talked in public, I had never used a microphone, and I started going to local TV stations and radio mm -hmm. shows to promote the classes. And the, the first time that I went, I think it was the local WUSA news, yeah. or I, the fo local folks news, um, with Holly, who's lovely and warm, mm -hmm. you know, one of the hosts, and I showed her how to make chicken tinga, and the moment they put a microphone and they turned the cameras on and we were interacting, yeah. they we were done with the segment, they turned the cameras off, and I was like, no, 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 I want to do this all my life. I just, it was so like a switch that turned on. As you're putting together an I'm episode. I'm adding the cheese, yeah. As you're putting together an episode. Yes. What are you trying to tell your audience? So every season we go into a different region of Mexico. Mm -hmm. And I started um, going to places that I already know, because it's like, I want to show people my Mexico City, I want to show people Puebla, I wanna, so I wanted to bring people back to what I already knew, because I felt strong there to show them yep. things that I <clears throat> knew, you know? And what happened was every time I went back, there were new things, they were changing things. Mm -hmm. and, and not only did I want to show the things that I knew, but I was excited to share the new things that I was learning. It's just an incredibly mm -hmm. humbling activity. So what's happened is, as the seasons have gone by, I've gone from wanting to share everything that I know, to wanting to go to places I have no idea uh -huh. about, to wanting to go to places that, you know, we just came back from Sinaloa. So. Season 8 is gonna be focused on Sinaloa. I had been to Sinaloa once when I was a little girl to Mazatlan. And uh, um, I just, I wanna go to places that have a lot of content. I wanna go to places that I wanna understand and that I think need a chance to tell their stories. And what's what's the, as you're developing the, the this season? Yes. What's the story oh. that you wanna tell the American public, your audience, about okay. Sinaloa? So, I mean, the last season we went to, to Baja California, mm -hmm. we went to Baja Norte and Baja Sur, and I feel like, so now I'm adding tomatoes. So this is like a la Mexicana, okay. you know? Um, I, it, it was my first time going to, to Baja Norte and Baja Sur. We did a crazy road trip, and it was a really different and new place for me. And we started dealing with themes that have to do with 
um, Mexican migration, right. you know, and how Baja Norte and Baja Sur are microcosms of Mexico. So it's trying to expand people's view on themes they think they know, because not everybody that goes to Tijuana is trying to go to the U.S. or gets to the U.S. Right. Ninety-five of the percent of the people that go to Tijuana to try to go to the U.S. find an opportunity in Tijuana and in the Valley de Guadalupe. And this microcosm of migration makes Baja Norte so exciting and vibrant and full of energy. And so, it, so what happens when people move that connects very much to my story because I've moved, my grandparents moved, my kids are Mexican-American, they're also Jews, you know, it's all these communities. What happens when people move and you bring the place that you come from with you? You bring your tools, you bring your knowledge, you bring... Your sauces. Your sauces! You bring everything <laughs> uh -huh. you got, you know? And once you get to that new place, you want to give it, you want to share it, but you also grow roots and you find a way to make it work with what you have. And it's the story of humanity, right? So one question I wanted to ask. So, yes. um, you know, it feels like many people, many Americans, just to probably unfairly stereotype, are afraid of Mexico. Yes. Right? But they love Mexican food. Yes. Right? <laughs> yes. So how do, you, how do you use food to help people, you know, not be afraid of the people behind the food? Yes, this is, a, this is a great question. I love that question. And I can answer from the point of view of my production team. My production team, they're all Americans, all from New York, mm -hmm. okay? They had never gone to Mexico. Really? Before they went with me. Um, I started working with this amazing team since season three. And they now, it's, I've seen like the transformation, you know? they adore Mexico, they're starting to speak Spanish. They know the difference between that chile and that chile, between a corn tortilla and a flour tortilla. And they found so many similarities between them and their families and Mexico and their families. Um, so I've seen like a micro version of what you're asking with my own yeah. team. Um, I think that cooking and food is really the most open and noble space where you can get to know the other and the foreign and the immigrant and the and because with food you're hungry you want to eat it like your walls come down because mm -hmm. we're animals too nice. you know <laughs> so it's i find that it's the the place that allows for the most communication so i i guess i just want to show the humanity so we were talking before we started about yes. social media a little bit. Yes. And, you know, social media in many ways breaks down the wall between you and your audience. Yes. So when you're looking at your Instagram comments or your Facebook comments, yes. are there things that surprise you in your audience? And you, know, you, you just wouldn't have expected that. Yes, absolutely. So um, as you were saying, you know, ironically speaking, because I, uh, because of the political climate that we're living in today mm -hmm. and all these rhetoric against Mexicans and against immigrants and the wall and the, um, you would expect for there to be um, sort of a um, rechazo, like a not wanting Mexican food. Right, because right. Of, but we are living in the, in the like highest height of popularity of Mexican cooking. So many times I will go to the, to the profiles of the people commenting and it's people saying, you know, no more Mexicans in America, or build a wall, or, but they want their taco night, and they want their taco Tuesday. So and they how, want to learn from you how to make tacos. And they, yes, <laughs> so for me, it's like, I'm very excited in that, yay, they love tacos, they love Mexican food, so it's just getting past that, you know, and mm -hmm. realizing how much a taco enriches your weeknight meal, but that taco has a tortilla that comes from nixtamalized corn from a culture that has been nixtamalizing corn from centuries. People that have families are proud of their corn. And I think we all love history. Mm -hmm. So it's going down yeah. to those basics. Yeah. Yeah, I'm very surprised with the comments that people mm -hmm. will write sometimes. Yes. And do you ever go back and forth with them? On um. Well, well, there was one yeah. one comment that really, I'm usually, I'm, 
I'm usually very understanding in that I'm not judgmental. Yeah. Anybody can have their own comments. You don't know where or why, you know, somebody's commenting something. But I find that the environment is getting increasingly politicized and radicalized. And I find that people are increasingly becoming more judgmental in deciding who is or isn't a label, right? And as a Mexican, a Mexican immigrant to now American, now whatever, I think I break a lot of, of mm -hmm. misconceptions just because. Um, but I was gonna say, so this one comment, I was in Tucson and I went into a restaurant store and they had Nutella tamales, okay? Nutella tamales. Nutella tamales. <laughs> and so I took a photo of the Nutella tamales uh -huh. and just put it up on Twitter uh -huh. and just commented something like, you guys, with a question mark. <laughs> like, what do you think? <laughs> Ali, I mean, it was crazy. I, the, the thing started getting retweeted uh -huh. and like really? fired up. And, <laughs> And people started commenting really nasty things yeah. like white people need to get off of Latin, white mm -hmm. people need to leave Mexican food alone, white people need to so so much hate. Over Nutella. So much yes. And yeah. I was like, I commented back, because usually I just let it yeah. lie, and I said, Did you know that the people making these Nutellas are brown Mexicans? They're not white. <laughs> And they're, no, they're Mexicans yeah. living in Tucson and they're making Nutella tamales because they want Nutella tamales. Because if you go south of the border, you will find that people love Nutella. I don't, we could have an entire conversation over Nutella. And, but, it's, but according yeah. to the police yeah. of like what's right and what's wrong, Mexicans are not allowed to eat Nutella because we need to retain some Mexicanness that wow. doesn't allow us to maybe have ketchup or pizza or hamburgers. So that, or, or, or people should not be mixing Nutella with tamales because tamales should be Mexican only. Yes, but right? the thing is, tamales, if you think about tamales, yeah. tamales, many tamales have pork as a filling. Mm -hmm. Pork came from the Spanish. Yeah. Pork wasn't native Mexican. So all these compartem compartmentalizing mm -hmm. of people are now are telling me, you know, what I need to do or not to be Mexican. And, and I really got upset and I got a few apologies over there <laughs> but it's the only time where it's, uh -huh. and it's not like I'm advocating there should be Nutella tamales on every corner <laughs> but you know right. make your tamales or whatever you want as long as they're good tamales oh, okay. and it has and they have good masa and they taste good you know okay okay where so, are we now so now this is cooked okay we have the nopalitos a la mexicana mm -hmm. and here we could add scrambled eggs and mm -hmm. make you know, um, nopal con huevo, mm -hmm. which is a great breakfast. But mm -hmm. I can also make you a taco. Okay. So you can taste the nopalitos Perfect. like this okay. with some queso fresco. Oh, yes. So these you can use as fillings for tacos. Mm -hmm. These you can use with scrambled eggs uh -huh. as a breakfast. You can stuff an omelette. Yep. See, omelette is French. This is French. Mexicans like omelettes but somebody could say you're not allowed. <laughs> let's, not let's try not to cause any controversy. Right. <laughs> um, what's the most interesting place you've been in the States? Oh, that's a very difficult question because my husband and my boys mock me and laugh at me because I will go anywhere that I haven't been. Mm -hmm. If I get an invitation to come cook and come speak, you know, Anywhere I've been to Little Rock, Tulsa, Nogales, and I think some of the most fascinating places to me have been the places near the border. So, for example, Laredo, in Nuevo Laredo, and the two Nogales, and those are fascinating to me. Nogales to me is one of the most interesting places. Fascinating. Such an interesting place. And I love Tucson. I say Tucson, Tucson. <laughs> it has such incredible food. But I mean, I I love the U.S. You uh -huh. know, just as much as I love uh -huh. Mexico. I always tell my kids that as Mexican Americans, we're very blessed because we can draw from two countries and two cultures that are so different. So but at you, the same time, we have double the responsibility, you know? So along those lines, if you were running an advocacy organization, trying to help Congress pass immigration laws, right? A good immigration system. Yes. What is the meal that you, would, that you think would change 
a, a or an opponent's mind. Oh right. my gosh. I mean, I think enchiladas are. Really? Yes. Why? Like a fabulous casserole of enchiladas yeah. is irresistible. I, wow. Because you're honoring the tortilla in the most incredible way, you know, with a delicious feeling, like just like seasoned chicken or chicken tinga, and then the rolled like really good corn tortillas, and then with a really nice salsa verde and some crease and melted cheese. And I wouldn't do something like modern or molecular, or you know, I would do something homey, like yeah, like a big. Enchilada casserole. That is not the answer I was expecting. What? I didn't, oh, I didn't you even know what, something fancy? I, I didn't even know what I was expecting. But that and was, you know yeah. why? And you know why? But because enchiladas, you were absolutely right. They're they're like a, you eat them all in the same dish. And they're easy, and they're not so foreign. Yeah, yeah. You're understanding, you know, another culture, uh -huh. but you're also eating how much you love it and right. how familiar it is. Yeah. Okay. Oh wow! Thank it's you. Your taquito. Thank you. And then my last question as we're yes. eating here. Go ahead and serve yourself. Yes. Um, I don't know if you need salt. I am sure it's perfect. Uh, so the name of the podcast is called Only in America. Yes. Right? And I ask every guest the same question. Yes. That just finished a sentence. Only in America. Dot, dot, dot. Oh. oh, my gosh. For me, only in America could I do what I do which I absolutely adore. Thank you.